So today we have Ellie Armstrong here to talk um, about her talk on querying natural histories. Ellie Armstrong is a UCL PhD candidate working with practice-based queer feminist methods to understand the construction of knowledge in space science galleries in London. Ellie ran a BSHS-funded Queering the Science Museum tours in 2018 and UCL-funded Behind the Glass Cabinet podcast series in 2019 that explored the, con the construction of displays of objects in science museums in London. She's also developed and de delivered tours on queer heritage for the Victorian Albert Museum, the Polar Museum in Cambridge, the Whipple Museum for the History of Science, and the Sedgwick Earth Sciences Museum also in Cambridge. And Ellie is no stranger to the society. She has worked with us here and the education team for the last two years, judging our Biomedia Meltdown competition, which looks at combining art with science. So today, Ellie will explore how we can challenge other aspects of the cis-heteropatriarchy in natural history museums, using her tours at the Cedric Museum as a case study. So let's welcome Ellie, thank you. Uh, hello everybody, um, my name's Ellie, as Leanne kindly introduced me. My pronouns are she, and I'm, ooh, hello, um, doing my PhD at UCL. Um, uh, so today um, I'm going to be talking about querying natural histories. Um, I want to think about the use of this term queer. Um, so in the tours that I run, and so specifically today I'm going to be talking about the tours that I developed for the Sedgwick Earth Sciences, but these, these things are more broadly applicable. Um, I use this term um, to connote a way of thinking, uh, using uh, ideas from queer theory, as well as being using the term queer to mean an umbrella term for people who identify uh, with gender and sexual identities that are sit outside of heterosexuality and cisgendered uh, identifications. Um, I'm going to, in my talk, be able to use this term queer interchangeably with uh, the term LGBTQ plus when referring to people's identities. Um, so if I use both of these words, please uh, take them to mean similar ideas. I'm using it as like kind of an umbrella term. However, um, it's also important to note that the term queer does have a history in relation to LGBTQ plus people. Um, and although it's been reclaimed in the recent past and is a term that people use to identify themselves, um, it has previously been used as a derogatory term. And for many people, this has ongoing negative connotations. So if you are uncomfortable with me using this term, um, maybe just gesture now. You, you don't have to like make a big thing, but I can try and change the way that I'm talking about this. Um, and also, please feel free to talk to me at the end if, this is, if you feel that I have used this term um, incorrectly or in a way that is uh, uncomfortable for you. Um, so today I'm going to use this idea queer and explore three ways that we can use it and it, that I have used it in the tours that I've developed um, for the Cedric Earth Sciences and also for the Whipple, the Victorian Albert Museum and the Science Museum. So I'm going to use it as a way of exploring people's identities, um, as a way of understanding theoretical constructs in science and technology studies and also um, to use it to understand how people can be transgressive of norms that are constructed by society at the time. Um, so, yep, these tours are for the Sedgwick Earth Sciences Museum. For those of you who don't know, they have a great Twitter presence. They have some dinosaurs that do lots of stuff around the museum. Um, I would highly recommend following them online. Um, they're a museum in Cambridge for the Earth Sciences faculty. Um, and they do, they have uh, stuff about geology um, and earth sciences and natural history through time um, in their collection. Um, and they do a lot of family activities. Um, so our dinosaurs here, uh, the dinosaurs here are doing um, some lovely, lovely, arts and crafts. Um, but um, these tours are specifically developed as part of the Beyond the Binary project, which is a University of Cambridge Museum central project. It means that all of the tour, all of the museums in the University of Cambridge have tours that specifically focus on LGBTQ plus identities. Um, I personally have written two of them and I deliver the tours at the Polar Museum as well. Um, but all of them are fantastic. So if you're interested, you should look them up online um, and go in 2020. They'll be running a new series of them, I think in February and then also later in the year. Um, okay, so the first uh, example from the tours that I've given uh, using queer as identity is to think about uh, Mary Anning. So Mary Anning was born in 1799 in Lyme Regis to a poor family with little education. However, when we now look back on Mary Anning's life, we see her as a leading paleontologist in the field, providing groundbreaking fossil finds despite um, having been overlooked in the ways that were previously told stories in the field. Um, and this can be seen at the Earth Sciences Museum in Cambridge. So I've taken a picture um, on the left-hand side of the plaque that goes with this specimen, and on the right, uh, the fossil that they have there. Um, it's important to note that in um, the Cedric uh, records, um, 
Adam Sedgwick didn't record who he bought this fossil from. Her name is not recorded in the, in the collection, um, even though many other male collectors at the time are listed as pe being the people that Sedgwick bought the fossils from. Um, and so we can see that, um, in part because of her gender, but also probably a, a class-related bias, Sedgwick didn't believe that it was important to relate uh, who, this who had dug this fossil up. The reason that we know that this, or we, we um, in, in infer that this is the fossil that Mary Anning collected is that, as you can see, very like faded because I guess the photo's not good, you can see it better in person. Um, there's a sketch in a letter that she wrote to Sedgwick where it's got a detailed drawing of the fossil and it matches almost exactly the fossil that the Sedgwick Museum have. And it's through this match that um, we're able to understand this being a fossil that Sedgwick bought from Mary Anning. It's important at this point to reflect that like Mary Anning is a privileged person who was able to write letters to Sedgwick and we have this record that has been retained in the collection so that we can identify her as being the person who had written, uh, who had discovered this fossil. But it's unlikely that this is the only case where somebody who had done the work who was not a straight white man of upper class Victorian establishment um, has been written out of the record in the Sedgwick Museum. So when we see this as a, a single case study, we can perhaps understand this as being a reclamation of some but not all of the loss that may have happened incidentally in the way the museum has been constructed. Mary Anning's fossils are not only found at the Sedgwick Museum, you can also go to the Natural History Museum in London and the Lyme Regis Museum to see more of the work that she's done. And she was an important paleontologist finding some of the um, first uh, complete skeletons of dinosaurs such as ichthyosaurs and pleosaurus. It's likely that both her gender, being a woman, and also her class, being working class and poorly educated, have led to her omission in the records and discussions about fossils, um, historically, which have typically been dominated by educated, wealthy, uh, white, upper-class men. Currently, there is a film in production about Mary Anning called Ammonite, which is likely to come out uh, later this year. This film uh, is rumored to have a lesbian plotline. Um, whilst Anning is never recorded as having a partner, the film is doing really strong work challenging the idea that the absence of any narrative about a partner for a, a historical figure means that they must be heterosexual, um, and rather exploring an imagined uh, homotopia where we're able to project uh, bi or queer narratives in, in onto historical figures in the past. Um, and so I've included this picture here because I thought I was like, when I was making these slides, um, I saw this come up on my Twitter feed and I was like, I feel like this is accurate representation of this. It says, I think we should all go through Wikipedia and add sexuality sections to every biographical article. They can read, quote, though he never officially came out as straight, he had three children with his wife of 27 years. And this has led to spec widespread speculation that he was heterosexual. And I think this speaks really clearly to the idea that we like, invariably presume that people of the past were straight in the absence of other dominating or, or considered um, concrete proof that they were not straight. Um, and we must like, think and question about why is it so damaging to assume that people in the past were queer? What is it about that identity that seems problematic if we were to imagine or speculatively attribute these identities to people in the past? Why is that seen as problematic? Um, and so although I don't have any answer, using queer theory to ask questions about this helps open ideas about how we could question um, the historical figures that we look at. Um, so Ammonite, the film, is part of a growing trend of reclaiming historically queer white women in popular culture. It sits alongside films like The Favourite that you might have seen about Sarah Churchill, Queen Anne and Abigail um, that last year was a huge success at many award ceremonies. Gentleman Jack, the BBC and HBO production about Anne Lister and Anne Walker, who incidentally were almost exactly contemporary um, individual historical figures to Mary Anning. Um, but again, we can think really critically about the types of people who are getting this like reprisal and reimagining in popular culture at the moment. Um, almost all of these are white, upper class, independently wealthy women, with possibly the exception of Mary Anning. Um, and so we can see that we not only have like queer as being a thing that uh, is racialized, uh, but also classed um, and gendered. We're not looking at non-binary individuals um, in this contemporary period, in this, in this reimagining of the historical past. Um, another way that we use queer as identity is to explore contemporary uh, figures in the natural history field. So much of the gallery spaces in the Earth Sciences Museum at Sedgwick are focused on uh, rocks from a geological perspective, understanding them as structures, what they are made of, how they can be used, uh, and um, the ways that we can use them to do science. But there are many other ways of understanding the, in the interactions of humans with the, social with the natural world. So um, in the collection, we have, um, you can see in the middle, some rocks from volcanoes that have different um, lava patterns depending on when they've been put down. Um, and Dr. Jasmine Scarlett, who you can see uh, illustrated here for a project that I did over the summer called Outliers, Materials Change Lives. We made a little zine of um, 
people who work on materials, um, and uh, it was for children, so it's a, a bunch of little stories about how scientists work on materials. Um, Jasmine Scarlett is a historical and social, vocal, social volcanologist, combining fields like anthropology, historical geography, social psychology, and disaster management to better understand how people live with their volcanic environment, and she personally identifies as queer. Jasmine particularly looks at the impact of the volcano Le Soufre on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. Um, Le Soufre is a strata volcano. Uh, it's also known as a composite type volcano and um, is shaped like a volcano. Um, so, and the, the cone is shaped by the volcano being built up over many years um, of hardened lava, lava pumice, ash, uh, making layered rocks like some of the ones that you can see in the cabinet that is pictured here. Um, somebody illustrated a talk that Jasmine gave as well, um, which I rather like. Um, she looks particularly at like intersecting approaches to understanding volcanoes and their impacts, not just geology, but also emphasizing cultural impacts that geological features have. Dr. Scarlett highlights the importance of different approaches for La Sufra. She looks at geoheritage, um, the mountain range, and the geology of the outcrops in the area. She considers ecotourism, how the volcano and its eruption shape the travel and visitors to the island, and also the cultural heritage of La Sufra, particularly including the presence of indigenous peoples and the impacts of colonialism and slavery for those enslaved close to the volcano. Dr. Scarlett also emphasizes that this is not the only case where this kind of um, transdisciplinary approach could be important for understanding the impacts of volcanoes. She looks at volcanoes like Mount Vesuvius in Italy and Lacha Sea in Germany that could also benefit from this cross-disciplinary analysis. We can also think about contemporary um, paleontologists and natural scientists in the UK. So I have some data to share with you from the Paleontology, Paleontological Association, PALAS, um, which to me is somehow like lovely like queer abbreviation, I don't know. Um, um, so when they uh, res like did a survey of people in the society, two thirds of the respondents were male and one third of them identified as female. Three individuals in the society preferred not to reveal their gender and three people gave other non-binary gender identities such as pan gender. We can see uh, like people coming into the field who maybe sit outside of this uh, cis gender identification. Um, additionally, 80% of the respondents were heterosexual, so we see still uh, a large number of people, perhaps over the average in the population as a whole, um, where just over 8% 8 8 of people identify as bi bisexual and 17 respondents identifying as gay men. Only three respondents declared they were gay women or lesbians, um, but most of the eight self-describers self described as asexual. So I'm going to come back to thinking about asexuality in the context of both science and also um, identity later, uh, but I think it's interesting to think about the spread of people who are doing this research at the moment and what that might, what the implications might be in terms of the research that people are doing. So um, we're going to now move on to thinking about using queer as a theory to identify and understand some of the ways that we might talk about science and technology. Um, often when we talk about um, animals reproducing in science, we think about sex, um, sexing the animals, so that might be describing them as male or female, and also um, even if those animals' sexes bear little relation to like, what we might think about as male and female in um, humans. Um, so in the middle picture you can see here we have these little ammonites. They're small marine animals which lived during periods of Earth history, including the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And they had coiled external shells similar to the modern living animals like octopuses, squids, and cuttlefish. Um, these particular ammonites that are in the Citric Museum here are found in two distinct sizes. Uh, we see larger ones and we see smaller ones in the historical record, but rarely any intermediate size. And this means that people have theorized that these these are uh, sexual dimorphism, where one of the sizes is a male and one of them is a female. Um, and people have widely assumed that the larger ones are female and the smaller ones are male. Um, but I want to ask, like, how much of this assumption that the larger ones are female and the smaller ones are male is to do with the fact that the smaller ones, the male ones, have a little sticky out bit that kind of vaguely resembles a penis? Um, are we projecting our understandings of physiology onto the behavior and sexual dimorphism of um, creatures of the past? Even as recently as 2015, scientists in the field have noted that it's commonly assumed that the microconscious, the small ammonites, represent the males, and the macroconscious, the large ones, represent the females. This hypothesis still, need veri ver still needs verification from soft tissue preservation. So we don't actually have significant evidence to suggest that this is truly the case. But it's not only the, in relation to these ammonites where we retain a lot of sex and gendered language. We do it in other areas of biologies too. For example, we talk about daughter cells and the splitting of organisms that reduce, reproduce asexually. 
Okay. The cells that re reproduce asexually um, are actually identical clones. They are not the like parent-child relationship that we see when we use the term daughter. They're in fact like identical versions of the same cell. We also use terms in, in um, asexual reproduction, like female and virgin mother, um, that suggest, again, a gendered, also sexualized reproduction framework that is mapped onto an asexual reproduction um, process. Um, in fact, even to think about sexual and asexual as two distinct types of reproduction in the natural world is, is a fallacy. Um, this is a binarization that doesn't necessarily take place as discreetly as we might like in our um, neatly binarized world that science likes to pretend we had um, at some point. Um, so we can think about like how um, some animals can switch between sexual and asexual reproduction. So for example, mayflies, where the female is able to reproduce asexually or sexually depending on the number of males in the field around them, uh, which is called facilitative pathogenesis, which I'm almost certain I mispronounced, so I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and we can also see that sometimes asexual animals may require mating or fertilization, or even the formation of hybrids with closely related sexual species, um, but they might not undergo what we would think of as the requisite genome mixing for their, act um, for their reproduction to qualify as sex or sexual reproduction. And this can be seen in species like the European water frogs, where we call this hybridogenesis. In fact, even when we think about asexual reproduction, it's historically been within a strict scientific context, which is rooted in sexual reproduction itself. So lots of this stuff comes from thinking about how animals reproduce sexually and seeing this asexuality as being a, a, like a deviation from the norm of sexual reproduction. And this is actually highly untrue for a large part of like evolutionary history. Um, animals reproduced asexually, and the sexual reproduction is a, a more recent in innovation in the natural world, as it were. Um, but we can also think about how this maps onto people's identities and expressions in real life, and how we can see that society has informed not only the way we treat people, but also the way we treat animals, um, and the natural world that reproduces asexually. So for example, Dr. Gupta, uh, an associate professor in queer feminist science studies, has talked with people who, uh, and researched with people who identify as asexual, and her research found that um, asexual people believe they are pathologized, isolated, and experience unwanted sexual relationships, sex and relationship fights with partners, um, and that their knowledge is less valued and less believed by others. And perhaps we can draw a parallel between the way that we see asexual reproduction as being deviant and less good, um, perhaps like we construct it as um, being without the benefits of sexual reproduction rather than a benefit in and of itself in a different way. Um, and this might help us understand the way that social norms are mapped onto both science and the way we treat other people in our society. The language around asexual reproduction, as well as the way that we frame it in the discussion, gives prominence to the idea of sex as being the beneficial and better way of doing reproduction and to the detriment of asexual reproduction. We can even see this in the way that we talk about horizontal gene transfer, the movement of genetic material, which is not the transmission of DNA from parent to offspring, which happens a lot in, for example, isolated bacteria groups in deep caves, is often seen as wrong or abhorrent um, to the norm of their sexual reproduction. Um, oh, uh, yes, so um, I just want to draw attention, and I'm going to use it again on the next slide, but um, on the uh, right-hand side, um, there's a little um, cartoon of um, some animals that do reproduction differently. These are from Human Comics, and I would highly recommend them. Um, they illustrate, using kind of little human figures, uh, ways that animals in the natural world reproduce that are different to the way we might think of, uh, like, cis heterosexual reproduction happening in humans. Um, so here, a lovely illustration of bonobo relationships, uh, which are wonderful. <laughs> um, and I would highly recommend there are series that um, are very good um, and uh, like facilitate quite an interesting discussion about the way that we perceive normative relationships in uh, our society. Um, so we also use queer as theory to, uh, as a theoretical construct to think about the way that evolution and sexual selection and sexual reproduction is used in the natural world. Um, the Cedric Museum has a large section on Darwin. They have a lot of the rocks that he collected and licked to work out what they were. Um, they're here. If you want to see rocks licked by Darwin, the Cedric Museum is the one for you. Uh, <laughs> I know. Somebody was like, "What do you mean they were licked by Darwin?" And I was like, "Well, it's a way that um, it's a way that <laughs> it's a way that geologists work out what the rock." is before they had things like mass spec. They used to lick them and you can tell a bit about it. When I asked on Twitter why people do this, someone responded so they can tell it's not their sandwich. Uh, I think which tells us everything we need to know about geologists. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so The Origin of Species, uh, Darwin's Magnus Open was written in 1853 and advocated for the sexual selection, i.e. that all sexual competition is for mates of the opposite sex and the more attractive the partner was, the more likely that sexual selection, uh, the more likely the sexual competitor was to win. The competition for mates um, was often manifested as a reflection or can be seen as a reflection of the Victorian culture in which D Darwin was writing. They have courting rituals where men competed for women. For example, this quote in Darwin's letter to Wallace, of 1868 um, says, quote, a girl sees a handsome man without observing whether his nose or his whiskers are a tenth of an inch longer or shorter than in some other man and admires his appearance and will say, I shall marry him. Um, I suppose, I suppose, so I suppose with the peahen, the tail has been increased in length merely on the whole by presenting a more gorgeous appearance. So what you can see is Darwin's drawing a parallel between the way that men in the Victorian culture that he lived in and peahens were growing and developing things that were for sexual selection. However, Darwin's uh, theory that women were like choosing, or, or females were choosing the, uh, their mate, was at odds with the Victorian judgment of women in culture, who were generally thought to be lesser than men. Um, and some of, uh, some of Darwin's initial thoughts were, were challenged on this basis. Um, the scientific, uh, yes, so, and, and additionally, the scientific understanding that uh, Darwin had of courtship between animals was strongly shaped by the, the Victorian ideals of monogamy uh, between a man and a woman, um, and that we might see that reflected in nature. However, and that we can see that reflected in nature, and Darwin suggested this was how people uh, were, this was the best way of relationships to happen. Um, but you can see that this actually, like, is not necessarily the case for many animals in the natural world, as illustrated by these lovely human comics. Ultimately, for Darwin, sex is set up as being about reproduction only, and it provides a strong narrative about sex being for procreation, helping to make queer sex or sex that is not procreative being seen as problematic or against nature. This was heavily influenced by Christian theologies at the time and Victorian conventions. Darwin believed that, believed that human romance was simply an evolved form of animal mating and not a divine gift given to humans by God, um, and attempted to demonstrate by this by finding examples of evidence of love in nature. For example, the mating customs of animals like birds that displayed elaborate rituals to attract mates. However, people were not convinced by Darwin's um, like, su suggestion that we as humans are like animals because there was a conviction at the time that particularly white Europeans, uh, but humans more generally, were a species apart from the rest of the natural world. And so um, that they had, quote, perfected love um, and reproduction through marriage. And so instead of making comparisons between the white, male, white men and women of um, the uh, society in which Darwin lived, he would often um, use racialized arguments, um, making links between people who were racialized by science to be seen as lesser, um, and the animals in the natural world to keep white high-class males at the top of a perceived hierarchy of nature. So suggesting that people who were uh, people who were perceived by Victorian science being closer to animals were more likely to behave in the sexual manner that we see in the animal world. By discussing sex, however, Darwin's work opened doors for people to think about sex and love in human relationships in relation to, in relation to animal. Um, so, for example, Hamlin recorded that no longer adhering to the old idea that sexual urges for sh were shameful, many authors began to celebrate sexuality precisely because of its animalistic and natural functions. However, even these new types of studies, researchers limited themselves to heterosexual section, sex in nature, and often all other types of sexual expression and emotional expression in animals were discarded as defects within the system. Darwin himself chose to ignore these behaviours when he looked at the natural world, for examples, despite them readily existing. Understanding sex as only having procreative motive meant that it was only seen to be important in that way. Queer and homosexual behaviour in animals is explained as being deviant and therefore in need of change or challenge. For example, George, George Levick, who um, observed the Adelaide male penguins having sex with other male penguins um, in the Antarctic, was famously shocked and wrote up in his notes that, quote, um, there seems to be no crime too low for these penguins. <laughs> So shocking was this discovery that he actually wrote this in classical Greek in his notebook. Everything else, everything else in his notebook is in English. This is in classical Greek so that only the educated men would be able to read and understand the true shockingness of this nature. <laughs> Okay, so finally, I want to think about using queer as a way of understanding transgressing societal norms. 
Um, and whilst when we often think about queer, we think about sexuality, it's impossible to think about heterosexuality, the relationship between people of binary or binarized identities, uh, man and women, um, as being without or in the absence of gendered constructions. Okay, Without understanding men and women as fundamentally different, it's impossible to understand a heterosexual relationship. And those gendered identities are highly societally constructed, and I want to spend a little bit of time of thinking about women who subverted and challenged gender norms at the times that they were working. So one way that women were able to be uh, involved in pioneering work of si any scientific stripe uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s was through heterosexual marriage. So for example, we're familiar with Marie Curie, um, but her husband Pierre worked alongside her and they won the Nobel Prize together. Other examples include people like Gertie Theresa and Carl Ferdinand Curie, who won joint Nobel Prizes for their work on glucose metabolism, but only he, the husband, would be offered positions at universities even though they won the award together. Um, finally, this, we can think that this would be, uh, if you were heterosexual and in a, in a marriage to a man, this would be massively beneficial to you, or, or it could be potentially massively beneficial to your scientific career. In the case of uh, Teresa and Corey, um, Gertie Teresa was pulled into a number of placements in scientific institutions because her husband insisted that if he was to get a position, she would also get the position. There are many women who may have been in unofficial um, homosexual relationships or unpartnered as a result of their, gender, of their sexual identity. And these people we miss in the historical record and also in their contribution to science. Um, so on the right-hand side, we see a picture of Carrie McKenney Hughes, who was married to Thomas McKenney Hughes, one of the Sedgwick chairs at the museum in the late 1800s. Um, being married to Thomas provided her with a way of going on the geological field trips that the Sedgwick uh, Museum ran, um, the Sedgwick Club, a student-run geological society um, from 1883 onwards. Um, because she was on those trips as a wife of Thomas McKenney Hughes, she was then also able to chaperone uh, other young women in the field who, for whom it would be irresponsible or um, unseemly to go on trips with only men of the Sedgwick Club. So she acted there as a way of facilitating the, act, the, the incorporation and inclusion of other women, including Famous, field, uh, famous geologists such as Gertie Ellis. Um, and these participation in geological field trips um, enabled their later success in the field and their prestige. Carrie McKenna Hughes is also a, a geologist in her own right, in, um, publishing um, texts including on the mollusca um, of uh, the Paleocene gravels in the neighborhood of Cambridge. Whilst we mainly know about Carrie through her marriage to Thomas, it's not just white women who are often seen through the lenses of their marriages and the voices of their partners. In the case of people in color, of color employed on digs and the voices of women and the voices of women of color are heard even less through the voices uh, heard even less by themselves and even more so through the voices of their male, typically white employers, um, and the lens of heterosexual marriage. So I've included here um, an example from the blog Trailblazers um, about the Palestinian excavation dig. Um, in the dig, um, they hired lots of people to come and do the excavation, digging out the soil, um, and they discuss, one of the texts discusses um, two women called Hayuda and Fatimi, um, who worked on the digs in, Palestine, in the Palestine Exploration Fund, and their marriage off to each other's relatives for dowry arrangement. Quote, my fear was justified. She proved too much for him, and after a brief but stormy union, she went back to her people. Now comes in singular complication. Mansur, for Hiuda, uh, Mansur paid for Hiuda by marrying his sister Fatimi to Hiuda's uncle Reitz. Fatimi and Reitz proved a happy couple, but when Hiuda came home, poor Reitz had to lose his bride, who was ordered home to her old home to bake and draw and water. Admiral business, but indifferent romance. Hayuda, who had been basketing earth for Mansur before the brawl, walked after her uncle Reitz and within a few paces of her estranged husband, while Fatimi, with easily imaginable rebellion in her heart, filled up her, her basket with the earth dug by her brother Mansur. But she never said a word um, or looked at, uh, at Reitz. She has been brought up well, said her brother proudly. So this is recorded in the diaries of the uh, person running the dig at the time. And actually, this, this tension in the heterosexual marriage that happened within uh, between workers on the dig caused such uh, um, unrest and uncertainty in the field that eventually he decided he would retire all the women from the dig in, um, that they were running and instead replace the women who were carrying the earth away from the excavation site with men using wheelbarrows, as pioneered by Flanders Petrie. Um, and this was particularly done to alleviate sexual tension between men and women who were working on the dig hired from the local communities in the areas where they were working. <laughs> 
This implicitly assumes that it could only possibly be heterosexual tension that would keep people distracted from work. There couldn't be any relationships between men that would might cause sexual freedom or any kind of tension in these spaces. And we also only see them talking about, uh, we only see Hayuda and Fatimi being recorded in this record because of their um, difficulty and their challenge to the expectation and norms of the person running the dig. By thinking critically about who is able to be included through these heterosexual ties, we can think better about the stories that might not be included. We don't get any stories about women in that dig who might have been sleeping with other women or men who might have been sleeping with other men, um, as they didn't fit the expected narrative or norms of the person who was running the dig at the time. Um, so this straight white male perspective is projected onto the lives and um, knowledge of the people who are working on the dig. Um, it's also worth noting that um, this idea of creating men only working communities in science is not uh, unique to digging things out in geology and archaeology. Um, it's also what the British Antarctic Survey did. So uh, the British Antarctic Survey wouldn't let women go to the Antarctic um, until the 1980s um, uh, because they thought uh, that it would be too sexually distracting for the men working in the field. Um, so we can see the idea that we are projecting uh, only heterosexual fantasies onto other people in our spaces. So um, my thesis in general draws on queer feminist approaches to doing research, and I use six guiding questions that I thought I would share with you today. And they have been in, they, these questions have informed the pieces of research that I've shared with you. Okay, it allows us to ask questions such as like, what counts as science? Why do we do understand some things as being scientific and other things as not? And who gets to decide what is being si considered scientific. So we sit in this room part of a society that does arbitrate on whether things are scientific or not, and perhaps we can understand, looking around this room, some of the people who might have been arbitrating on what counts as science, and we can think about what might we have left out um, by not including them. Who does science? I've talked a little bit about identity in science. Um, and then how we think about science as being developed in tandem with social norms that occur at the time. Finally, we can think about how science, um, or critically approaching science in this way, could help us understand either the way that we do science or the types of social norms that we might want to change and challenge in the field around us. And finally, um, one of the things that we might want to think about is how does our being um, interact with the knowing that we might have in these spaces, and how are these two things co-constructed? So what, how does you understanding yourself help you understand the work that you're doing, um, and how are they mutually involved? Um, if you're interested in coming to these tours um, or learning more about queerness in science, the tours at the, the uh, Cambridge University Museums are happening at the Zoology Museum, the Cedric Museum, the Polar Museum, and the Whipple Museum for the History of Science. Um, and so you can go and learn about how we might approach queerness in science and technology um, in a number of different ways in a number of different institutions. Thank you so much.